I think I'm live. We are live. Hello, everyone. Um, so the way this works is you ask questions and I provide answers. And if I'll do my best to answer, if I don't know the answer, I will do my best to direct you to a resource that can give you the answer. So in the comment section, just type whatever questions you have for me. Um, go ahead. You can, you can ask me anything. I reserve the right to refuse to answer. Um, but I will tell you a, a question that just came to me um, that I think is a really good one is working on consonants with singing. Consonants are a very important concept and they, they take a back seat to vowels when we're singing because vowels are so primary. Vowels, vowels are where the music of the voice is. Vowels are also how we uh, control uh, the value of, of the vocal tract resonances. And these resonances and the interaction of the, the vocal tract resonances with the sound wave is critical. It is what is going to give you success in accessing your full range and eliminating breaks and cracks and all of these things and, and working your tone. Um, but consonants, consonants have an important function. Well, first of all, consonants are bits of noise that give us understandable language. So they're obviously part of speech and lyrics and singing. But consonants can provide a couple of things that are important to us as singers. Number one, consonants can become another layer of resistance to the flow of air. Uh, we, we hear a lot about S-O-V-T, semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, and that will be the straw, um, tongue trills, lip bubbles, but consonants also help provide that. And depending on the consonant you use, right, whether it's a hard glottal, you know, or something that's a voice consonant, mum, 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 that's going to give you different levels of resistance. And then there are consonants that are more aspirate that can help you if your voice is really locked up. I mean, if you're feeling a squeeze, mum, 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 putting an SH, sha, 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 can encourage more airflow. And so it is the consonants can assist in this balance of airflow versus resistance at the vocal folds. But the other thing consonants can do is they can help control the resonance values, particularly, that's a hard word, particularly, anyway, particularly, a lot of consonants there, with um, that first resonance. The first resonance is what gives us all kinds of trouble. And when you feel strained, when you feel cracking, when you feel yourself like hitting a, a limit, you can't sing into your mix, it's usually that first or lower resonance is chasing the pitch. It has uh, locked on to a part of the sound wave and it doesn't want to give up this relationship. And so we start to yell. But if you notice, if you put your finger on your larynx and give me a B, 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 pops your larynx down. And the larynx and the position of the larynx will have a direct effect on the value of this resonance. That's why often voice teachers will talk about the larynx, the height of the larynx. Um, and uh, there is no one particular height that your larynx should be, but your larynx should be within your control. So if your larynx is raising because the body, the nervous system is trying to maintain this connection of this lower resonance to the sound wave, right? The B, 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 will help break that. So if you are straining, ba, 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 if you, ba, 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 that consonant will help drop 
that resonance. And the physical manifestation of that is you will see a lowered larynx. Um, it's not that a lower larynx in and of itself is what we're chasing. What we're chasing is balanced vocal resonance. Also, the difference between M and N, they're subtle, but you can hear mm, 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 mm. M as you do this. Mm, mm, you can hear the frequencies lower a little bit on the M and raise a little bit on the N. If your voice is sounding a little dull, right? If you're going, because very often we'll get obsessed with this low larynx thing because we, we feel it help and we'll over lower the larynx. Well, that's great for warm up, but not so great for singing. Put an N, na, 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 it'll brighten the voice. But if it goes too much, na, 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 try the M, mum, 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 mum. You can use consonants to help uh, two things, help control the resistance, the flow of air and your vocal fold resistance to the air, and also help control the resonances. The most direct way to control the resonances is through the vowel. However, the consonants definitely give an assist. Um, Yes, but if I say particularly, yes, with a British accent, it, it drops all the R's. It is. It's loads easier. The other word I struggle with is, I'll use a British accent, regularly, because regularly is, I, I often get garbled on that. But um, let me see. Hi, John. My question is about my Bridger Passaggio. I am a classically trained tenor. I sing modern worship music, too, when I narrow... Um, when I narrow in my bridge around F sharp four to G sharp four, I am lacking power. Any tips? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So the reason that we narrow when we get to that part of our voice is because of this lower resonance and its tendency to want to track and follow the voice. And what happens is that that first resonance basically has a ceiling and right around F sharp four for lower voice types is where you will feel that ceiling really start to hit and you either have to yell or let go and flip. So what narrowing does, uh, uh, you can hear it. It drops those frequencies and it drops that first resonance, but it also drops the second resonance and the higher resonances. And so what happens is everything kind of drops and we lose vocal power. We need these resonances to interact with the sound wave and boost the sound wave. So what I suggest is the narrowing is great. Yeah. So if we're narrowing, if we're here in this bridge area, here it is on the F sharp. Yeah. So I'm not yelling, but I'm not able to sing that with a lot of power. And if I try and press into it, it just flips. So the key is that we want to keep that first resonance relatively stable, but we also don't want it too low. And then we want to kick in those upper resonances. So what I would do is start with that buh. So we get, we get that lower resonance. So we're not yelling. And then use this sweep of one, wah. That filter sweep what, will start you narrow and then open it up. So you start to feel one, 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 one. Ooh, let me see. I can open that a bit at the mouth. One, 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 one. And as I go to this G sharp, A flat four, I'm going to get my tongue a little more activated because that tongue, ah, ah, is going to help boost those higher resonances. So it's a little more one, 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 one. So I'm able to lean into that ha! without pulling up and yelling. So as you're losing power, you're likely over narrowing the valve. <clears throat> over narrowing is great when we're warming up. It's actually, I think, essential for a period of time when someone is getting their voice together, especially if their tendency is to yell. 
Um, but that that's likely what's happening. Um, let me see. I have several students over pronouncing R in songs, which makes their singing more lab laborious. <laughs> Love that word. I'd actually have them do it more British. Yeah, so <clears throat> the really hard American R, er, er, the tongue actually becomes a bit of an obstruction. Um, it's, it's raised so much. And what happens in that sound is it lowers the higher frequencies. And so singing on that R, first of all, that hard American R is not really a, a pleasant sound. <clears throat> used to be more of a, of a country thing. You know, you get that constant sorrow, but even, even country singers back off that. that. So yes, I will encourage students to do it um, a bit more uh, standard British. Um, however, it can be a useful exercise um, get this from um, Chadley Ballantyne. And he does this weir. And as he goes to the er, weir, uh, the weir, it actually, you feel a focusing of the higher frequencies. And it, it, it can be um, a pretty useful exercise. Let me see if we have any more questions. So please do just type away. Um, I'm here for you uh, for the next hour or until we run out of questions. Or otherwise I will, oh, you know what? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill in the time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna improv. <clears throat> I can't dance very well, so I'll just continue talking. Um, so for my email list, I sent out uh, this morning an email. I, I give my list like vocal tips. And, that, and the thing that I talked about today, which I think is incredibly important, is having something to help focus you. And I have various devices that I use in order to keep me focused and locked in when I'm either writing or I'm practicing. And in my practice area, I keep a bit of technology that's actually over a thousand years old, an hourglass, a sand timer, it's less than 20 bucks on Amazon. The one I got, I think it's a 20 minute timer. Um, and I just, when I go in, I have the ritual before I practice, I turn it over and that physical ritual actually helps focus me. It lets my brain and body know we're working now. And then the watching that sand fall through, I know as that sand is falling, I can't have any distractions. I am working. And there's also urgency because as you get going in your practice, there are things that you want to work on or really focus. And as you see that time coming to an end, you know that you don't want to waste time. Now, of course, you can always extend it. And very often the, the sand runs out and I keep going. But if you do that as a minimum, Right here, I keep next to me because I, I sit in here and I write. This timer is something I got cheaply, again, on Amazon. And what I can do is I just press this button and it counts down. So right now, I am writing my new book. I'm about just about 5,000 words in. And I set that for 25-minute segments. This is called the Pomodoro Technique named after the Pomodoro tomato because the, the person who created it used one of those kitchen timers that looks like a tomato. You work for 25 minutes, you take a five minute break, you work for 25 minutes. And during that 25 minutes, you can't be disturbed. There's no browsing, there's no Facebook or, or TikTok, you work. And I will tell you, so when I get up, I do at least two 25 minute um, segments preferably three of writing. This morning I did three 25 minute segments of writing. And it's amazing what you can get done. Get something to help focus you and keep yourself disciplined. Um, microphone tips. Should you practice with a mic to find the position most effective for amplifying the voice? Um, Philip, that's, that's an interesting question. Yes. But there are always going to be 
variations because as soon as you leave that environment, right, that you've dialed in, let's say you've got your little PA system or karaoke system and you go to sing somewhere else, everything changes. So how hot that mic may be, how much they're riding the gain, is there, is there um, compression on the mic? What effects are on the mic? Affects how much of this you need to do. So with a typical raw mic without any type of compression or effects on it, when you go for higher notes, you will, you will tend to just need to kind of pull back and ride it a little bit. Um, so you do, you do have to be listening. So if you're working with that, sure, that actually can be good practice to kind of get used to that. But it, you, you can't let it be set in stone. And usually with, with pretty good vocal technique, because you're not screaming, um, you, you, you know, you don't have to be doing this. Very often you, you may see a singer kind of do this. That, that's a bit of a, of a cheat, if you will. And I love vocal cheats, so don't get me wrong. It, you, every performer should have vocal cheats in their bag that they can pull out when they're tired, they're not at their best, etc. But this particular vocal cheat, when you see this, here comes the big note, you pull the mic away, you turn the hip face over here. If you make the note, you lean back in. If you don't get the note, you kind of throw the head back with a rock and roll toss and let it go. So there, there's some of that mic technique is, is not truly just to keep um, the input levels consistent. It's, it's a little bit of a cheat. Um, Yeah. So yes, but it's good for you. Get back on your, on your writing. I know you're writing a book. Um, good for you. Yeah. The hourglass, the reason I love the hourglass, I love my timer, right? This is a little more digital. I don't do a phone. Oh, I just turned the timer on. Uh, I don't do a phone because the, the phone, first of all, it's a distraction device. If I let the phone into my practice area, it is put on do not disturb. If I needed to look up lyrics or I want to record myself and listen back with um, the voice record function, because it's very, very handy. And I do recommend doing that in your practice, right? If you're trying a couple of different ways of doing something, record yourself, you know, and sometimes as I'm singing, I will clap to delineate when I'm trying the second approach and then I'll listen back to see which was more effective. But the phone is a distraction. And also this timer, it's just this big single digital thing I see ticking down or the sand, this organic falling of the sand that just will, it works, it works. Oh, let's see, baritone voice training. Um, well, actually, Julia, you asked first. Let me let me get to you. Oh, uh, wanted to ask you what to do when a piece is played at a fast tempo and there's no time between phrases. Take a breath quickly and get to the next note in time. Can you please tell me how to take a breath in such cases and how to use it efficiently? Love this question. So what you want to do is first get the lyrics on a piece of paper and look for the best places to breathe and. The best places are where there's a period, right? Or where there's a comma or where there's um, a, a, a closure of a, of a thought, right? That there could, would naturally be a pause. So you don't want to breathe in a, in a word like some thing, right? Or something in the way she moves. It would be something in the way she moves. Attracts me like. So you, you, you plan those, but the way to take a breath really fast, right? We want to have this nice open posture. So the, the chest is kind of up, like you're feeling proud, not, not a sway back. The ribs are open and all you need to do is let the tummy drop and pop out real quick, that fast. So you can, I can expel breath. So pretty much out of breath and right there. That's all I need to do. And even better, I should feel like I've been exercising. So my vocal folds are really far apart, right? When we're breathing heavy, 
they, they pull apart. So the glottis, the opening is wider. I just, and there's your breath. So you can do it very, very quickly. So practice those fast breaths. And then where you see in the lyrics where you should take a breath, put a little comma above that. And have that as a guide and make sure that you breathe in those places. Don't be haphazard with your breathing. Make that part of the practice of learning and getting the song going. Um, baritone voice training. Why are singers going higher in the registry, becoming more tenors musically, or bass baritone singers becoming null avoid or disappearing? Is it hard to write music for baritone voices? You know what? This is just, it's kind of like style. And it used to be that baritones were really prized. You had singers, you know, Robert Goulet, who Will Ferrell uh, famously did, I'm Robert Goulet, and did his baritone voice. But, but in the early 60s, um, appearing in the musical Camelot, Robert Goulet became a huge star for his rich baritone voice. You had immensely popular singers like Bing Crosby with more of a baritonal voice. Um, even, even Frank Sinatra was not this high twang tenor. And then um, Johnny Cash. There were so many of these rich baritones. And then as, as rock and roll music became more popular and certainly pop, and it, it's music that tends to... Um, be focused on young listeners, especially pop music. Most people, it, it happens a little um, sooner um, for females than men, but but in that that period in the the um, late adolescence, early teens, um, around thirteen or so, and guys, I think it's a little more like fifteen. But you really start to open up to music, and you become passionate about it. Music that is your favorite music of that period really sticks with you your whole life. That's why nostalgia is such a big business. But at that age, I think the higher voices are also a little more um, attractive, and that's um, that's just just part of the genre. So I don't think, you know, in the 90s, I think rock kind of started to become a little more enamored with with lower voices. Um, and you had that a little a little bit of that. But what was that band? The Crash Test Dummies. Um, even Pearl Jam was not the same, like really high tenors that you had coming out of the 80s and the heavy metal people. So and also people just love high notes, you know, and that's one of the thing things, you know, I'm a voice teacher. I am I am getting older and it's it's happening as we speak. And of course, there are changes in the voice and um, I, I work my voice constantly. But ultimately, you begin to lose some range. That's just uh, the fact of it. And I feel this pressure to keep my high notes up because that's just what makes people. Those are the money notes. Yeah. Let me see. Jan, hey, thank you for coming. Yeah, Bing Crosby became a bass as he grew older. Yep, yep. Any ideas on how the artist name Prince had such an amazing range? Um, and how did he, in your opinion, achieve that? So Prince, for me, is one of the greatest contemporary artists of all time. I, I think his genius in terms of songwriting, production, singing, performance, playing is like unmatched. I was watching um, some, I, I think it was his Sign of the Times tour, uh, the video, and he is so locked in and so dialed in and so physically precise and his dance moves and his energy and his passion it, it's almost, I almost couldn't watch it because it's overwhelming. Prince is just an absolute genius. Prince also was not a baritone um, because Prince was not a tall man. Prince was was uh, quite relatively short. Uh, I think he may have been 5'3", five, 5'4". Five, and he had a smaller vocal folds and a shorter vocal tract so he had this wonderfully high voice. 
He also really, he's got his voice, um, his falsetto, one of the best falsettos of all time. His falsetto just had this, this crispness and this bite to it. Um, and his scream is just so incredible. Um, you, you listen to a song like um, Nikki or, or uh, is it The Beautiful Ones? My gosh, when he goes into that scream, it's, it's, just, it's just stunning. And, and that scene where he sings The Beautiful Ones in Purple Rain is just so emotionally impactful. Um, and I also think he, for me, you can, you can fight me. I think he gave the best Super Bowl performance of all time. So um, an incredibly hard, oh, sorry, I'm rolling on a wire. Give me a second. Um, yeah, if you haven't seen his Super Bowl performance, it is well worth watching. Um, just absolutely stunning. So I, you know, Prince studied, I'm not sure how long, but we shared the same voice teacher, um, Seth Riggs. I, I studied with Seth quite extensively uh, way, way back in my early days. And Seth taught everybody in Hollywood. My gosh, Michael Jackson. I remember Michael Jackson coming in after me. Um, I had to clear the room. Um, but meeting Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys there, meeting Rod Stewart and Jennifer Lopez, and all these people just coming through, coming through, coming through. And um, so so Prince just, he he had lessons, but I think Prince just had this innate ability. And he also had a, a smaller, more agile voice. And sometimes the bigger voices, they're just harder in some ways. You know, I've, I've got a bigger voice and it's, it's a, a blessing and a burden at the same time. Um, yeah, the Crash Test Dummies lead singer's voice. Yeah, I mean, look, singing lower... It's kind of cool. There's uh, Peter Murphy from Bauhaus. Um, if there's there's any uh, goths here, but Peter Murphy just had this wonderful deep voice, and um, on that song "Cuts You Up," he he does this this great thing where he will he will track himself an octave below, and it's just it's just wonderful voices. Even though uh, Peter Gabriel who's still singing really well in his 70s, if you listen to his new stuff. But Peter Gabriel has this heftness and richness to his voice that's just absolutely wonderful. And Peter can sing higher, and he's got a wonderful falsetto. But most of his stuff, he's not. He's the tessitura of his stuff is not Steve Perry. Yeah? Um, and I've told this story before, but I had the surreal experience of Walking down, uh, the, there was a grocery store next to my my vocal studio, and walking down the grocery store aisle and and seeing Steve Perry pushing a cart coming towards me, and I was, I really struggled with wait wait this is like, a hugely influential vocalist rock star, who's like coming down the cereal aisle. I I, I just couldn't put it together. But Steve Perry, he's not tall. So he's, he's just really, it just, he's a very, very natural tenor. You know, the other voice, if you've ever listened to the group, yes, you may know the song Owner of a Lonely Heart from back in the 80s, John Anderson, who can still, he's got to be almost 80 if he's not 80. And you can look him up on YouTube and he's singing that material from 40 and 50 years ago in the same keys it's, it's mind-blowing but his voice is just so naturally high um let me see uh oh is it more difficult to write music for the baritone voice i haven't honestly i haven't pondered this question but i would say no you just have to understand how the baritone and the climax of a baritone's voice is not the same as a tenor's voice. So, for instance, if you put this um, G4 in a song and you make this a climax note for a tenor, it's not really going to have an impact. But if you have a true baritone voice or a bass baritone and you give them this G, 
it is going to have a different intensity. And so it's, it's just understanding the voice and that you're not going to be writing these B flats or these Bs for the climax notes, but it may be Gs or, or possibly As. And, and therefore, and, and they, will get, they will get the same emotional impact if you just understand just, just the keys and registration. Um, Stephen, how you doing? Does the temperature of our surroundings sur affect your range in the way it can affect instrument tunings? Um, yes, but there, there are some other elements. So dryness. So I, I live in an area where, um, near the, the ocean and usually the humidity, humidity levels are quite high. But in Southern California, we had what they call the Santa Ana events. And the air, even where I am, got bone dry. And I really felt it in my voice. So you, you speak as if you are aware as a musician. So if you are in a very, very dry climate and you have a beautiful acoustic guitar, you will likely keep it in a case with a humidifier because as we know, you can get fret sprout, right? The, the wood starts to shrink and, and it affects the tunings and all of these different things. The dryness will, now that takes a little while for it to affect the guitar. It can instantly affect the voice. This dry air, they have a thing in Las Vegas called Vegas throat um, because it's so dry and then you're often in air conditioning which just keeps the humidity super low. That's why Celine Dion, uh, when she was performing at Caesar's Palace, had the space uh, humidified for her voice. Um, so yes, yeah, so bitter cold can affect and dryness can affect. That's why if you're in a very dry climate, you should basically, when you can, breathe through your nose. It just gives a little more time for the air to become moisturized by your body. And... There is some studies that suggest dry voice. You know, I keep this um, nebulizer. Oh, it's not going to go. Hold on. There it goes. So this nebulizer, which is, this is not steam. This is actually saline solution that's being turned into a breathable mist. This sticks to the vocal fold. So I highly recommend a nebulizer. Recommend a nebulizer. You, they're cheap on Amazon. They're, they're like around 40 bucks. You just need a portable mesh nebulizer and then you can get this um, saline solution. It's less than 20 bucks for a hundred and you just breathe that. That really, really helps. So yeah, the humidity levels are huge. Um, and of course, if it's bitter cold, that, that can impact the voice. But usually with bitter cold, it's the dryness. You know, we, we usually by the time, it, really freezing cold air. Yeah, can do it. Being in Southern California, we don't get that too much. But I remember I was doing a gig in Banff, Canada. Um, oh my God, how beautiful that place is. But the, at the Banff Springs Hotel. And I remember getting out of the van that brought us from the airport and, and I stepped into that winter air. And it was so cold when I breathed it in, I started coughing. It froze my lungs. So <clears throat> how hard or difficult is it to remake songs in a lower register, is it uh, different or will the words and timing of phrasing? Um, actually, no, all, all the lower register is going to do, right, is you're just going to move it, everything down. But all the relationships and the pitches and the intervals and everything stay the same. But if you move it down um, two half steps or semitones, then your high note, is going to be two half steps or two semitones lower, um, but it, but you don't you don't need to change the words or the phrasing or anything like that unless that's something that you choose to do. There is great software out there now. There there has existed for quite a while software that will change the key of a song without changing the tempo. Um, I use something called Amazing Slow Downer, but I'm sure there's there's other stuff now. I believe QuickTime will do it. There's stuff online that can do it. But now there is fascinating technology 
um, this AI that can separate the voice out from a track so that you can create a karaoke track or even, or you can also pull a favorite vocal out and have it isolated just for, for study and intense listening. Um, the, the song that was just released, the new song by the Beatles, they, they had a demo that John Lennon had done on his piano in his apartment uh, back in the 70s. And they had gotten these demos from Yoko and they had turned two of the songs uh, in the 90s. They, the, the remaining Beatles got together, including George, and they recorded this. But this last song, they, the piano and the voice was so muddled together, they really couldn't make it work. And um, they abandoned it. And now, and but George had recorded parts for it. So now coming back to it all this time later, Peter Jackson in doing the Get Back documentary developed, he, they worked with people to develop a technology to extract the voices out. Particularly because when John, when they were recording the Let It Be sessions with the movie cameras, if he didn't want them knowing what he was saying, he'd just make noise on his guitar. So in order to get that dialogue, they had to be able to extract John's voice. And this AI technology allowed them to take John's voice from that existing demo. And so they were able to uh, do the new song. But this AI, at, at least some version of it, exists. You can go online. Some of them are subscription, but they have a free option. And you can upload a song and it will separate this out for you. And then you can just take software and shift the keys. There's, there's wonderful, wonderful things we can do now. So, ah, uh, yes, uh, my Dimash videos, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get, I keep saying that, I'm gonna get back to reaction videos. <clears throat> People do seem to like those. <clears throat> reaction videos, I will just tell you, they are tricky because you are reacting to someone else's material. I totally understand and respect that. Um, and if somebody, very often, they will monetize my video, which is fine. And, and some of these videos, if they get enough views, you, you're, you're talking about hundreds or even thousands of dollars. But if it goes to the artist, I'm totally fine with that. It's their work I'm reacting to. Sometimes they won't allow it to be shown, which is a drag, um, but that's fine. But there are those that give you copyright strikes. And um, if you know anything about YouTube, if you get three copyright strikes in a three month period, your account is not only gone, but you can't open another one. So everything you, that you've built up over YouTube disappears instantly. And you, there's nothing you can really do. You'd have to go to court and fight this. So I have gotten a few ridiculous copyright strikes. So I'm, I'm really, really careful about doing these reaction videos. And I even, and, and I've gotten copyright strikes on songs. I usually make sure that other people have done the songs. And so I'm not going to be penalized, but sometimes it's just the luck of the draw and they notice me and they, they zap me. Yeah. So I have to be really, really careful. Do you sing songs in different keys to exercise your passaggio or make your low notes warmer or to practice singing falsetto or head voice, for instance? Philip, this is a this is a great question. And the answer is yes. And here's what I recommend. When you are working uh, a song, go ahead if and, and I encourage everyone to be somewhat keyboard literate. You know, get a small portable keyboard. Even if you got to do it by ear and, and pluck it out, find at least the starting note of the sequence that you're singing, right? And, and play that starting note and sing that little sequence. And then move it up a half step and then move it up another half step and then move it down and then move it back. And you will find after you've moved it up that when you come back to the original key, you may very well have an easier time singing that. Or, or let's say that it, the, what you're singing, that's great if you're maybe straining or struggling with it. Believe it or not, taking it higher can sometimes help remove that strain because you're forcing your body to, to let go of that. Um, but if it's really rather weak and falling apart, take it down a 
step or so and sing it lower where you can find a little more purchase on the voice and then by steps bring it back up. So I don't necessarily do whole songs in different keys that I'm going to sing them in, but I will certainly practice key parts of a song in different keys. That is a wonderful uh, thing to do, and I, I highly recommend um, doing it. So I am going to take a hit off my little uh, nebulizer here. Has my voice feel a little dry as I await the next question? I don't recommend doing this in a car. Might get you pulled over, but <clears throat> anyway. Questions, questions. I will tell you so much of this singing game. And singing is ultimately irreducibly complex. There is so much that goes on in the act of singing. And the highest form of singing is not this technical stuff I'm talking about. It is emotionally connecting with the listener and communicating on this high level that only music can do. That is the highest level of singing. But in terms of this, this technique stuff, so much of what we are doing is really acoustics. And learning to work acoustics in the relationship of the vocal tract and the resonances within the vocal tract and the sound wave itself. Every acoustic space has resonances. And you will experience this. Maybe um, you're watching a movie and you've got the sound up kind of loud and there are certain um, sounds or maybe uh, listening to music loudly, certain pitches, and all of a sudden things will rattle on your shelf. And what's happening is that frequency is being boosted by the acoustic space. And that's why um, in a recording studio where they're in the mixing room, they're very careful about the size and shape of that space because they don't want certain frequencies boosted over others because the engineer will pull that frequency down. Well, now that actually, when you listen to it in another environment, that frequency is going to be too low because the room created this boost of the frequency. Um, engineers and live sound have to, to check all the, the frequencies in a room. They'll shoot out psh, white noise and, and then uh, use analysis to see where they see peaks and they pull those frequencies down. So these acoustic spaces, we have them in our vocal tract and we can change the size and shape of these rooms. So these resonances become incredibly important. So if I was going to tell someone what's one of the key concepts that you should really focus on as a singer, it's vowel tuning. It's understanding vowels. It's understanding resonances and how these align and how you can registrate your voice to eliminate these issues. Let me see. I find that singing something in my lower range will free up my voice to sing the song better in the upper range. Yeah, Philip, and, and this is a thing. Experiment. Experiment with your voice. Play with your voice. Um, don't, don't be locked in to routines. I just did a course um, that I released on um, my singer membership site, voiceschool.com. And this, this course is called Imagery and Movement. And imagery is something that I've really changed my mind about in recent years because I was taught that imagery is just going to confuse the singer and you really got to look at the cause and effect and what's really happening in the voice. But Imagery gets a bad rap because in the past it was often or at times imposed by the teacher on the singer. And that imagery maybe didn't work for the singer. But I recommend that you spend time with your voice, sing something, really pay attention to what you feel, right? Analyze that. 
And then start to ask yourself, what images come to mind? Like, what does that feel like for me? And then try it again using that imagery and then compare, was that better or worse? So like for me, helpful imagery, I can think to sit up straight or I can think my head is a helium filled balloon. That imagery helps. I can think, oh, hey, don't push up for this high note. Or I can think, and this is helpful for me. No, you know what? I'm floating above these, the voice and I'm placing these high notes down. I'm above setting the high note down. That imagery really helps me. So there's different things. So always be experimenting with your voice. I love that you're experimenting with the different keys and seeing what that does. And I recommend getting a little journal, right? One of those little mead composition journals. Um, they're inexpensive. Have a pen there and just make notes of when you compare what works, what helps, what doesn't. Let me see, voice training versus vocal strain for unprofessional voices. How would we begin to tell or know the difference? Um, so vocal strain, let me see, as a singer. Oh, okay, so, so vocal strain, there's usually a few things happening here. Um, but when we have vocal strain, there is usually an acoustic issue um, we are trying to push the resonances, particularly this lower resonance. We're trying to push it too high to track the voice. And the way that you do that is by squeezing at the throat and widening the lips. That's why everybody, when they're straining, kind of makes that same face. And then what that does is that engages the shout reflex in the voice. And then that shout reflex will come with a clamping of the vocal folds. So we start to get excess pressing at the vocal folds, which requires more air to get the voice working. There is a concept. I just did an email to my list on this yesterday. If you're not on my email list, go to johnhaney.com and get on it. Um, but I talked about phonation threshold pressure and what that means. This, this term PTP is how much pressure does it take to get your vocal cords vibrating? Phonation, making sound. And the higher that number, the less, the less good it is for your singing. Um, we want that phonation threshold pressure to be as low as possible for the note we're making. That gives us ease. So when I, there is a high level, and you can, if you can buzz your lips like a trumpet player, try that. Now squeeze your lips really hard and do the same thing. You have to push much harder to get them to buzz. Wipe your lips dry and try it. You have to push harder. So what we want is well hydrated vocal folds with this nice mucus, this moisture on the upper layer. And we want it to the folds to come together, but not, hey, squeeze. We want, hey, as opposed to, hey, because I can feel I have to work harder for that. You can feel the strain come into the sound. And then that your vocal cords are banging together harder, which will cause them to probably swell. And then if you keep doing that, you may start to develop uh, irritations, which then callus nodules. And so you can get vocal problems from that. So we want to stay well hydrated. The older you are, the more important this is because dryness starts to become a factor. You need to work your voice and you need to find ways to do this um, in a balanced way. And that's what vocal exercises are for. This, I love this thing. This is um, Dr. Vox. I, this wasn't given to me, I paid for this. Um, it's a little pricey for what it is. It's about 50 bucks for a plastic bottle with a little silicone tube, well worth it. There's water in there, helps create resistance. So it's kind of like a, a vocal straw. And then also um, you, the bubbles, you want to keep the bubbles going steady. And you can feel there's more ease in the voice when you use that. Um, uh, Karen Tietze Cox, Ingo Tietze's daughter. Ingo Tietze is the uh, voice scientist who came up with the straw phonation. She just wrote a book, just came out. 
on straw phonation. Um, and I'm going to have her on my podcast. I just reached out to her. So maybe I'm announcing it prematurely, but I'm planning on it. Um, so uh, watch for that. But but I recommend getting Karen's book if you want to learn about SOVT. She also has YouTube videos as well. But these can help. These semi-occluded vocal tract exercises can help you start to work your range without the strain because the back pressure coming from the straw helps the vocal folds approximate and regulate that airflow without you without the body feeling the urge to squeeze. It's incredibly, incredibly helpful. As a singer, am I singing to the mic or through the mic or through to the stars? That's an interesting question. So here's what I do, yeah? I was taught this by someone long, long ago, and I think this is incredibly helpful. When you go into a space that you're going to be singing, go ahead in each corner of the room, just put like a little mentally place, a little bright, shiny diamond, right? Glowing. And then think about extending your energy to each of those diamonds. So you fill the room with your presence. And then you are just singing to the stars, the diamonds. You can put a star in each little one. But yeah, you are singing, you're not singing like to the mic. You're, the mic is just a device to capture and, and lift your voice over, right? Electronic amplification. So opera singers usually don't use a mic. And when they do, there's a lot of controversy. But so, so you don't need a mic if it's just you and a piano or you and a guitar. But of course, as soon as there's drums and electric guitars, you need that lifted over. But it's not something that should become an impediment. It is just an extra device. It's like you're playing acoustic guitar and then you you add an, a pickup to the acoustic, right? That that shouldn't change what you do necessarily. So don't become over-focused on the mic. Your, your focus and your energy and your attention should always be external. You are listening to the other musicians. You are interacting with the other musicians. You are, you are connecting with the audience. Your energy is to them and expressing to them. The more you sing, the more you perform, the more the self dissolves. Great performances are not the self. Stage fright is a focusing on the self, right? You're worried about how others will receive you and judgment. When the self dissolves, there is no judgment. What are they judging? And I, I love meditation. I think singers should meditate. And there are meditation exercises where you actually look inward to find the self. <clears throat> and it's a very interesting thing because as you look for where the self is, it tends to dissolve and you can't find it. And it's actually a wonderfully freeing feeling and as a performer, it's abs absolutely vital to, to just be in flow and the beauty of that. Are vocal folds or cords controlled by muscles and would doing regular neck or throat massages help? So the vocal cords are made up of ligaments surrounded by muscle and then mucosal tissue. But they are also connected. They're connected in the back to these little cartilages, the retinoids that, that move that are connected to muscles and they, they can move like your shoulders forward and back and move like that. And then they are connected in the front to this bump you feel, the, the, what's called the Adam's apple, the thyroid cartilage, and they're uh, attached to the back of this. And then this thyroid cartilage can, can tilt. There is some evidence that this I'm back. I'm back. You know what I did? And this is, I should know better. When I do these, I plug in a hard wire to my modem, but I forgot to turn my wireless off. So now I'm hardwired. So excuse the interruption. So fascia, we're talking about these muscles. I'm not sure how much you missed, but they're, the vocal folds are made of muscle and there's, there's multiple muscles that control the pitch making, but also fascia, which is this netting that exists through the body and in through the muscles. And it basically holds us all in place like this big bodysuit. And this idea, the way, the way fascia works, I'm going to pull this up. 
right? This is a tensegrity model. So this model, right, it's held together in space, but none of these dowels touch each other. They're all connected through tension. And then if I move one part of it, the whole structure moves. One thing moves, everything moves. And our bodies are more like this. They're not like buildings with bricks stacked on each other. It's more of a tensegrity. They've actually coined biotensegrity. And the tensegrity is tension plus integrity. And this fascia, if we move one area of the body, it will move into other areas. So tension in one area will radiate up and into the voice. The, the fascia is all connected. It's all one, right? It's like the skin. We don't have parts. I can say, yeah, this is the skin on my hand, but that's just a distinction because it connects into the skin of my forearm and, and my bicep, right? My shoulder. So massage is very helpful, but you don't want to be in there, right? Doing all this grinding. What can be very helpful? If you feel tension, just go ahead, like in your neck, take your fingers and just press and allow yourself slowly, but steadily, you just press a little deeper and a little deeper. And what happens is that that fascia can be very hard. Like if you do this with your palm, you'll feel it rock hard. But if you press gently and steadily, you'll feel it almost kind of melt and give. And that is what we can achieve with that fascia. We want everything flowing like honey. So yeah, so look, if your larynx feels tight, you can just pick your larynx here and very slowly and gently just pull down on it. And you will feel everything just start to give way. If there's jaw tension, take your fingers and just press gently, but, but continuously, deeper and deeper, and you'll feel it give way. And then you can open your mouth, right? Slowly. If I try and do it fast, I feel my mouth lock. But if I slowly, it opens more and more and more. So, yeah, this, this fascia is, um, it's tricky. It, it, again, it can be rock hard or it can be really, really firm. I keep gummy worms to um, show this to my audience. So gummy worms are made from collagen, which is basically what fascia is. Um, and if I pull this gummy worm really hard, there's resistance. It doesn't go very far. If I pull it slowly, it'll keep stretching and stretching and stretching. And this is a beautiful visual of how your body should feel. Don't make your singing rapid jerky movements. It's flow. You want a, a beautiful image of singing and for the body, honey. Just everything within flow. But it's not a collapse. We want this toned, we want this ready. Singing is a physical event. Singing is more physical than piano or guitar. Right? All instruments are hard, but singing has a physicality to it. And, um, you know, my first instrument was drums. Drums are very physical, but singing is physical in a different way. And certainly just the, the connection of the breath to the folds. To, and and we, don't, we don't see these muscles. We don't have this, the, the, the connection. The biofeedback that I get from my fingers, I don't have that with my voice. So everything is, is much more fine-tuned. It's much more internal. It's much more thought-driven. Good friend of mine, Mike Goodrich, um, who, who's a wonderful teacher, and, and he has um, The Inner Singer, and he has a wonderful podcast. But he was on this years ago about this mind connection to the voice and how vitally, vitally important it is. Let me see. Is taking vocal lessons good for improving voice or? So voice lessons are good for anything. For voice lessons are good for your speech. So if you're reciting prayer, if you're giving public talks, if you are uh, singing, it's all strengthening and coordinating your voice. Um, I just recently published an ebook for older singers. So 
for singers um, 50 up, 50 plus. And it really, you have to be working your voice consistently or you are going to start to lose the ability. Um, you're going to start to deal with atrophy. You're going to start to deal with weakening of the voice. So taking lessons or at the very least having a program that you can do is going to keep your voice incredibly healthy um, for your lifetime. So um, I want to thank everybody. That's our hour. Um, thank you for showing up. I appreciate uh, you sticking with even with the little uh, technical hiccup. And uh, we will do this the first Tuesday of next month. Take care.